See, we're not living for us, but we're living for Christ, for Jesus. And one of the ways that we can do that is by sharing our story. Now, during my Bible study on Philemon, I challenged the group to work on writing their testimonies. And this is an important thing for any believer to do, to have their testimony ready and prepared just in case. For instance, you're, you're talking to someone and you invite them to come to church and they ask why. Why do I need to go to church? And what makes your church special? I mean, can I just connect with God on my terms, out in nature? And then what has God done for you anyway? Now, this is an extreme example, but it could happen in our climate today. So how many of you, if presented with these exact questions, would know how to respond in a way that would be not disrespectful to the other person, but also inviting and encouraging to get them to come to church? And yes, you could talk about the obstacles that you've overcome, but the simple fact of freedom is what we should focus on. It's our freedom. And the more compelling part of your story ought to be what happens after you have been set free. Now, we started our call to worship with Psalm 116. Well, a little further down, that same psalm says, What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Truly, I am your servant, Lord. I serve you just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people in the courts of the house of the Lord in your midst, Jerusalem. Now, this future tense of the psalm is all about a response. You have freed me from my chains. Therefore, I will sacrifice a thank offering to you. Therefore, I will fulfill my vows to the Lord. You see, Peter then tells us that since we were ransomed, we will set our faith and hope in God because we've been purified by grace and we can love one another. So let's go to where Peter says that and turn to the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. It's verses 17 to 23. It's on page 850 of the Pew Bibles. So it's 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 17 to 23. It's on page 850 in the Pew Bibles. And we have a tradition of reading responsively. I'll read a verse, and you read a verse, and we'll go back and forth or something like that until the end. So it's 1 Peter chapter 1, starting with verse 17. It is page 850 in the Pew Bible, if that's what you're using. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17 says, Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Now, I would like you to read verses 18 and 19, please. Verse 20 says, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Read verse 21. Verse 22. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. Read verse 23. 
God of 100% pure love, all honor and glory we give to you. Continue to make ourselves 100% pure as we obey your truth and show others your love that comes from our faith and hope in you. Holy Spirit, come down amongst us here in this room. Be with each one of us and soften our hearts and our minds and open our eyes and our ears to receive what you have for us to hear today. So Holy Spirit, be in these words that the message from God should come through. Amen. Now, did you notice all of the past tense, all the completed action in 1 Peter, very similar to the Psalms? You were ransomed. You have come to trust God, and you have been purified. And you have freed me from my chains. Now, all of this talks about what has already happened. As a part of what we do when we come together to worship is to celebrate this freedom. To give thanks for this blessing and to live out this purification by living in love together. You see, once you deal with what's happened, what you've been given already, then you can talk about a response. So the psalmist tells us that we have been freed from our chains, that our bonds have been loosed. And Peter says that we were ransomed from the feudal ways of our ancestors. Now, salvation is a given, they seem to be arguing. It's a gift and was done by God's actions, not ours. Specifically, Peter says, through the precious blood of Christ. Now, this means that our emphasis isn't on how to get saved, but rather, for what are we saved? What will we do with this freedom that's been given to us? Now, Granted, we could spend our time talking about what we're saved from, the futility that Peter speaks of and the snares of death that are mentioned in Psalm 116. And we could even talk about if the salvation from Psalm 116 is the same as the salvation of 1 Peter 1. Maybe it is. But we don't want to focus on the fact of being saved, but on the result. What happens because of our bonds have been loosed? Now, what are we ransomed to do? Or better yet, not the result, but the response. What's, that's what we need to consider together. What is our response to being set free? See, this is what will make a difference when people hear our testimonies. What our response was to being set free. Now, there seems to be three responses called for in today's scripture. So let's start with remember. Remember. A part of our response to being set free is to remember what life was like before we experienced this freedom. Now, the author of the psalm recites the journey, the reasons that caused the poet to call out the name of the Lord. And this might seem relatively minor, and our inclination is to often say, let's move on, let's, let's look ahead, don't spend time looking back. The whole looking back thing is what caused so much trouble for the Exodus journey. If they'd learned to let the past be the past, then they could have got, gotten on with following God, and maybe it wouldn't have taken them 40 years to get across the desert. And this is a good argument, to be sure. Except what was happening in the wilderness wandering was not remembering, but it was a growing nostalgia of what happened. See, they weren't remembering what it, was, what it was really like when they were slaves in Egypt. They were creating a false reality that sounded so much better than it really was. And we often have that trouble with history. We want to view it through those rose-colored glasses and think that it was some sort of a golden age for everyone. The golden days, the good old days where everybody prospered and everything was happy and smiles. And Well, it wasn't that way for everyone. It wasn't. See, the call to remember as a response to our salvation is a call to be honest about where we've been and where we've come from. It's also an opportunity to talk about forgiveness, not just from the God who has showered us with grace, but from the people that we've hurt or neglected or overlooked. It's an opportunity for us to embrace some humility and some empathy for those who don't know yet what we know about being set free. 
We remember in order to keep our feet on the ground, to keep an honest perspective about who we are and how we aren't really the authors of the good story our life is turning into. We remember so that we can embrace the other two responses to our freedom. Now the response of the psalmist is perhaps the clearest. Because we remember that the Lord heard our cry and God loosed our bonds, we will praise. Now praise is the second thing that we should do in response to our salvation. Now the end of Psalm 116 is an act of worship that's mingled with a way of living one's life in all its power and grace and joy. There's exuberance in these verses that can't be denied because it's important not to skip over that joy. Now there's praise and then there's praise. And too often we give God praise because it says so in the bulletin or on the screen and that's what we're supposed to do at that time. And the psalmist goes to great lengths to offer this praise as a response to what's been done in the life of the one who sings the praise. Well, another noteworthy element of praise is that it's both private and it's public. We too often individualize our response to God. We call it a private matter. It's just between me and God. Well, the scriptural witness is that faith and our response to God are never intended to be a private matter. In fact, the sign that our faith and devotion to God is real and true and deep in our lives is that we are willing and able and unrelentless in sharing our joy or offering our praise in the whole community of faith. There's a corporate component to our worship that's an essential element to the expression of faith. Not neglecting to meet together, says the writer of Hebrews, in calling us to be the body that we are called to be. And through this all, we also need to remember the author of all this giftedness. This is our third response. We remember what Jesus has done for us. So our worship today is remembering what Jesus has done and who he is. And Peter walks through this for us and with us. So our testimonies, consider they need these three things. First, we need to remember what we were before. What our lives were like. What we were searching for. How we felt before. Then we need to praise God for calling us and for us accepting him. And then we need to remember what Jesus has done for us, how we have responded to having our chains set free, for us being loosed from our bondage. That remembrance and how, what, how it has changed our lives since then, that's the bulk of our testimony because that's the important part. You see, when we share our testimonies, we tell his story and we tell our story. That's what we bring and what we offer today. And we can do that because we have been set free. So we can remember what it was like. We can praise God for being there for us when we accepted him. And we can remember everything that Jesus has done for us since that day. We have been set free. So we should be telling his story and our story with everyone we come in contact with. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for inclining your ear to us. We have been born anew, not of perishable but imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. Even though we've committed sins, you have loosed our bonds. You have released us from our chains. So now help us to share our joy in our homes, our churches, our communities, and in the world. Give us that courage to tell our stories and to tell your story intertwined with ours. We pray to this in your matchless name. Amen. I'm going.